This is a production of Cornell University. Well, thank you, Michael, uh, for that uh, introduction. And it's, it's a pleasure to be uh, talking to a group of uh, students, faculty, researchers at Cornell University. Um, actually, I was inspired by a professor from Cornell uh, on the path of entomology that I took back in 40 some years ago, which was David Pimentel and Richard Root, uh, who actually were the ones that started uh, exploring the role of vegetational diversity on pest dynamics. And that's what basically, uh, I, that, that, that work provided a theory for the work that I was doing with small farmers that were intercropping corn and beans. And we noticed that there were lower populations of pests in the intercropping systems and in the monocultures. And, um, and then Pimentel and, and Richard Root were the ones that provided the, the theoretical background and, and framework that I used and many, 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 many other people I used. Uh, <clears throat> I also wanted to say that, uh, that in, I'm now retired, but, um, and I'm farming, but I'm also um, continuing some interest that I had many, many years ago when I was a young guy in Chile, uh, which was music. I had a rock band and, uh, and we compose songs that we put in the in the in YouTube once in a while. Uh, although we're all dispersed, some are in Spain, in Germany, in Austria, and Chile, and, and I'm here in Colombia now. Um, we can do it with the technology. So there's a link in the uh, <laughs> in the, in the uh, chat session where you can, if you want to listen to the song. Uh, it's in Spanish, but it has some English subtitles, and it's called "When I Look at the World." Okay, so I'm going to start uh, sharing the screen then uh, um, to, um, to address the topic that, that, that I'm supposed to address today. Um, basically, um, what is the role of agroecology in the reconstruction of a post-COVID agriculture and food system? And um, as agroecologists, for a long time, we have said that industrial agricultural systems have become a major force that are modifying the biosphere and uh, they occupy about 80% of the 1.5 billion hectares that are devoted to agriculture. And most of the systems are homogeneous monocultures that are advancing at the, at the, at the, the expense of, um, of natural ecosystems. And they have become dominant uh, ecosystems then. And <clears throat> The, the, the pandemic, um, long before the pandemic, as agroecologists, we were, we were warning about the industrial agriculture becoming too narrow ecologically, highly dependent of, of farm inputs, extremely vulnerable to pests and diseases, and now, and now to climate change. And now, as demonstrated by the COVID-19 pandemic, prone to a complete shutdown by unforeseen crisis. Like never before, I think that COVID is showing how closely linked human, animal, and ecological health are becoming. And in, in agriculture, it's obvious that the health of the soil, the health of the plants is linked to the health of people and the health of the planet. Um, <clears throat> so industrial farming, um, I think one of, in the narrative of, on, on COVID right now, I think that there's a lack of analysis of the root causes of the problem. And industrial farming has a lot to do with the crop on cultures that cause deforestation, or the way we, we do industrial animal raising with genetically similar domestic animals that are confined and all that, um, and the chaotic mixing with wildlife uh, with animal production have created the conditions for the spread of, the, of this deadly pathogen, many, many pathogens in the past. And uh, for example, in Latin America, if we look at South America, the advance of transgenic soybean, there's about 56, 57 million hectares already of this, uh, monocultures um, that are advancing at the expense of natural vegetation. And uh, there are some ecologists like Wallace and others that are saying that, uh, you know, as this agriculture advances at the expense of these natural habitats where there's wildlife coexisting with thousands of virus species that, 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 um, that could actually potentially um, uh, be uh, contam con contagious to, to humans, if we destroy these habitats that contain these populations, they become in touch with the domestic animals and with humans. And that's one way in which these pandemics are, uh, are exacerbated. And what we're seeing 
is that the, the, the COVID has impacts on food system, on the processing, on the marketing, and uh, on, the, on the food production. But at the same time, food production and the food system that, 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 that is uh, existing today, the prevalent one, is also affecting the dynamics of COVID-19. And there's a work that, that is in, in, in being done right now by uh, Paolo Titonella and a group of people that are, that are looking at, you know, uh, at what level uh, it is, um, the COVID is affecting food production, the trading, the marketing, and the entire food system. And at the production level, definitely we saw disruption of, um, and, uh, of access to input and output markets. Also, um, it, it highlighted the importance of uh, local farmers and, um, and how um, society now is paying more attention to rural areas as places to live and, and, and produce. So one fact that is important to understand is that despite the fact that uh, industrial farming uses 70 to 80% of the land, uh, uses uh, injects into the environment about 5.2 billion pounds of pesticides a year, uses 70% of the water, 80% um, of fossil fuels, produces more than 30% of the greenhouse gases, um, only produces 30% of the global food that we eat. Actually, the ones that produce the food that we eat are small farmers, and this has been well documented not only by agriculturists but also FAO and other organizations. So clearly, COVID has revealed the sociological fragility of the, our current industrial globalized food systems, and the effects of the pandemic are being felt today in, in, in every way. So therefore, a transition to a more socially just, ecologically resilient, localized food system is, is urgently needed. And I think that's one of the main uh, challenges that COVID is posing. The transformation of these industrial systems based on monocultures, you know, high inputs and uh, that are highly degrading, that are also causing deforestation to a more sustainable low input agriculture is, that is much more resilient, much more diversified. And agroecology then emerges as a science that not only takes the, advantage, uh, the advances of um, modern science that we as university people work with, ecology, the basic agricultural sciences like soils and, and entomology and plant pathology, social sciences, but also the knowledge of farmers. In Latin America, we're blessed to have uh, thousands and thousands of traditional farmers, some of them indigenous uh, farmers, and uh, what agroecology in, intends to do is to, is to promote a dialogue of wisdoms from which principles emerge that take different technological forms depending on the conditions that you face locally, environmental, social, political, cultural conditions. And what we're envision, envisioning as a new agriculture for the future is an agriculture that has to be decoupled from fossil fuel dependence, agroecosystems that have a low environmental impact, that are nature friendly, that don't cause deforestation, uh, that are resilient to climate change and other shocks, that's, that is multifunctional, that not only produces food, but produces ecological services, but also keeps culture in place because there are thousands of people that are still in the rural areas and they wanna remain there and, uh, and they provide a, a huge cultural service. And they must be also the foundation of local food systems because that by the year, 2030, 80% of the world population is going to live in cities. Cities of more than 10, 10 million people are going to triplicate, tri triplicate in numbers. And each city of 10 million people has to import about 6,000 tons of food per day that travels about 1,000 kilometers. So that's totally unsustainable. And that also points out at the fragility that cities have that are dependent on, on masses, massive amounts of food that has to come from the outside. So agroecology then shows a different way forward by providing principles on how to design and manage agroecosystems that are based, best able to face and withstand the crises that are coming in the future and the, the actual the ones that we are facing right now. <clears throat> because they, 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 they exhibit high levels of diversity and resilience, um, therefore this agriculture is much more able to reduce risk from many threats. And the contributions of agroecology to a post-COVID agriculture, uh, we actually wrote a paper with my wife, Clara Nichols, who is uh, also an agroecologist and teaches at Berkeley, that actually um, uh, in the Journal of Peasant Studies. And we, we, we feel that there are 
four major areas in which agroecology can contribute. The enriching of nature's matrix, the revitalization of small farms or peasant agriculture, the alternative, the creation of alternative production systems of animals and enhancing urban agriculture. So by doing this, we basically are creating alternative systems of animal production that, are, that create healthy animals that don't use antibiotics. Uh, therefore, there's an absence of antibiotic resistance. Um, uh, eco uh, by restoring the, 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 land, the land, landscape matrix, we're creating ecological fibrics where actually the wildlife is contained with their pathogens. Um, and then obviously by creating urban agriculture and um, diversified rural systems, we create nutritional diversity and food security, increase also human immunity if you have access to antioxidants in, in vegetables and fruits, which leads to better livelihoods, uh, local food sovereignty and environmental and human health. So the first, uh, approach is to restore what we call the landscape matrix, basically combining elements of agroecology and ecological restoration. And in agroecology, the preferred landscape pattern is a complex matrix of fragments of forest separated by a variety of small farms. And in such environments, a lot of research is showing that, that this, uh, these systems that are rich in biodiversity perform services for agriculture, such as biological control, pollination, organic matter decomposition, but also coexisting with wildlife species. So this complex matrix creates ecological fire, fire, fire breaks, as I said, that help contain pathogens from ecological release. So a matrix like this, that is surrounding a farm in Guatemala here, you can see that it, it, that it provides a tremendous amounts of ecological services for this farm. For example, when I was studying the systems in Tlaxcala, Mexico, we, not, we, we looked at the, the surrounding environment that, uh, <clears throat> that around the farms that we were studying, and we found that all the farmers um, derived a lot of their food from the field. The fruits, the, the, the borders also were producing fruits up to 0.64 tons, uh, which actually, con after the family uh, ate all the food and they uh, were able to market the rest, he provided $600, uh, that's one third of the income that came from, from the farm. And then other researchers in, in Asia have found that rice fields that are surrounded by a complex matrix have more predators than rice fields that are surrounded by simple habitats. And therefore that leads to more predator abundance, less pest incidence, less pesticide use and higher yields. And less pesticide use is very important because there is a lot of uh, pesticides that are immunosuppressors. And in a time of COVID-19, that's something to consider. So there's many elements of um, eco agroecological restoration that we use uh, in order not to emphasize only the uh, design and management of the local farms, but the matrix that surrounds that farm is, is quite important. And uh, there are many peasants organizations in Latin America that are promoting restoration of, uh, of landscapes in order to stay in their territories. Because for example, this, this, farming, this farming region in Oaxaca, uh, in the Mixteca of Oaxaca in Mexico, uh, farmers had to leave this area because they had been devastated through deforestation or grazing, but many farmers chose to stay. And uh, they started a process of, of ecological restoration by reforesting the top of the mountain with Pinus oaxacensis, a, a local species, practices of uh, soil regeneration and soil conservation and water harvesting, which led them to the production of food and allowed many, many people in the community to stay in the area. In Colombia, here, not too far from where I am, in the, Valle, in, in the Cordillera uh, Occidental, in the, in the West uh, Cordillera, uh, a, a group of farmers in, an, in a region called Bellavista, in the community of Aldovio, actually um, they, they decided to stay in their land, but they had to resolve one main problem, which was a lack of water. So they started a process of re reforestation of the micro watershed. And this allowed for the uh, production of food uh, because there was a lot of water, on, not only for the families, the animals, but also production of food. But they also had to transform their, their, their farming systems from monocultures that were highly dependent on external inputs, but also degrading soil erosion promoters uh, based on arracacha, which is a tuber similar to a potato, uh, cassava, 
and others. And they started then uh, promoting uh, plants like uh, Titonia diversifolia as borders, as a production for green manure, but also, for example, using Ricinus communis, which is a plant that produces a lot of biomass as temporal, temporal shade, but source of biomass to end up in, in an agroforestry system today that has more than 25 species, a system that is highly biodiverse, highly productive, highly resilient. And the, the impacts on the community were, was that there was more water, more diversity, less dependence on external inputs and food sovereignty for the community. And what we have found also through many researchers in, in, in the region, like Kerry Hall Jimenez, for example, we found that, for example, the systems that are more diversified are, are less vulnerable to hurricanes. And we have actually, we're finishing a paper from a major project that we conducted in Puerto Rico, Haiti, and Cuba after the recent hurricanes. But we're finding the same thing that Eric Jorge Jimenez found back in the, in the early 2000s, that the farms are more diversified and more resilient. They less, they less damage the more cultures. The same thing was Cuba, you know, after Ike, where, um, we found that the farms that were more diversified are less vulnerable to, cl to, climate, to climatic extremes than monoculture systems. So the, the, the other part uh, of uh, contribution that agroecology can have is the optimization of urban agriculture because the production of fruits, vegetables, and eggs near consumers increases dietary diversity, nutrition, and local food security. There's more access to, to healthy food. And uh, this is not new because in the 2005, the UNDP came out with a report saying that about 30% of the food consumed in the world, major cities, was coming from urban agriculture. So eating nutritious plant-based foods can fortify people's immune systems. And one of the big examples uh, at, at the national level of the promotion of urban agriculture is Cuba, that after the the collapse of the Soviet bloc, one of the problems they had is that they didn't have any more fertilizers, pesticides, or machinery or gas to bring the food from the rural areas. So they started promoting urban agriculture and um, actually more than 50,000 hectares that provide more than 50% of the vegetables consumed in ma major cities, producing meat, goat milk, eggs, and generating jobs. And one of the features of these systems is that they can produce between 15 and 20 kilos per square meter per year of food, of edible food using agroecological management systems of soil and crop rotations and intercropping systems and so on. In our farm in Colombia, we're promoting this very rustic um, um, raised beds. Uh, many of the soils are very acid, very rocky. So we, we basically just put on top of that a lot of um, um, leaf material and, and then we cover it with a compost and then we produce the crops in, in that system finding that uh, actually one square meter can provide 20 kilos of food. Um, that's about 200 tomatoes, 36, 36 heads of lettuce. And if each person eats 72 kilos of vegetables per year, a 10 square meter garden that produces 200 kilos can satisfy 55% of the annual vegetable needs of a family of five. Now, the, the last contribution, I think, and perhaps the most important, is that agroecology can re revitalize peasant agriculture. And there's a lot of evidence, a lot of reports that have come out that agroecology restores the production capacity of cities of small farmers. And um, small farmers play a very important role in Latin America, but also worldwide, uh, not only because um, they have a traditional knowledge that is very useful, uh, they keep um, much of the bi agrobiodiversity. Uh, they, uh, they, at the world level, um, 7,000 species, 7, species of crops are in the hands of both farmers. About 2 million varieties are also in the hands of local uh, farmers, which is the basis for the genetic, uh, the genetic um, basis for the agriculture of the future. They produce 50 to 70% of the food, depending on the country. Um, but using only 25 to 30% of the land, using 30% of the water and 20% of the fossil fuels. And we have some examples of research that we did back in the 80s, for example, in Chile, we set up this small farms of one hec half hectare, one acre, asking the question, is it possible to feed a family of five uh, with a half hectare without using external inputs? 
just based on an agroecological design. All this has been published, but basically the summary shows that um, th this half hectare after three years of conversion after agroecological management, they were producing so much food that there was a surplus after meeting the, the, the family food needs in protein, in, in, in calories and vitamins, et cetera, which when they were sold, actually uh, they act, uh, increased the income of the people. So these people, not only, they didn't have to buy any food, only oil and rice and sugar, everything else was, uh, was produced on their farm. So they didn't have to spend money on food. They didn't have to spend money on inputs. And then they, 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 the excess, the surplus they could sell. Uh, in Cuba, there's some very many examples, also small farmers that are uh, totally self-sufficient, but also they have a surplus for the market. This is the family of Casimiro, um, who started as a conventional farming using uh, growing corn and tobacco. But after being trained in agroecology by the ANAP, he actually re re redesigned the farm with a network of hedgerows and windbreaks that play a major role against hurricanes, but also in terms of producing fruits and wood and, and energy and, and dividing the farm in different plots that were devoted to different farming systems. And the most interesting thing of this farm is that uh, <clears throat> it came to almost zero dependence on external inputs. At the beginning, it was highly dependent on external inputs. Today, the farm functions without uh, inputs from the outside. It's able to produce enough protein per hectare per year to feed 34 people uh, with an energy efficiency of 30. That means they put one kilocalorie and they get 30 back. Industrial agriculture's energy efficiency is about 1.5. And then obviously the, product, the, the creation of alternative uh, animal production systems where the animals are not confined and they're, and they're not you know, uh, in, in, uh, causing deforestation is to combine actually fodder crops, grasses and leguminous herbs with shrubs and trees for animal nutrition. In these systems, the antibiotics are rarely used since the animals live outside and their diet is based on plants grown in organic rich soils. That's strengthening the, the immune system of these animals. And um, there are many, many, many systems here in Colombia where they have converted these bare uh, pastures that are highly susceptible to drought and so on that depend on, on nitrogen uh, fertilizers and so on to the systems where you create uh, this forest, uh, increasing the, um, the current capacity from one to animals to 5.1 per hectare and increasing um, milk production from 1.7 liters to 4.1 per day. So there's less, uh, the, the systems are much more um, inducive to a better animal health, uh, welfare, animal welfare. So they're more productive. And here you can see in this farm in El Atico, which is in the, in, the, in, the, in the Cauca Valley of Colombia, where actually you can see that the production of milk is still around 10, regardless of the irrigation regimes, or I'm sorry, the, the, the precipitation regimes. The, the conventional farms that have monoculture, the production goes down when the drought comes, this system maintains um, a resilient production throughout time. So <clears throat> now the idea is, that agroecology has to be amplified. How these different cases that I have shown you can be uh, amplified, uh, scaled up. And we feel that there are many avenues. One is the creation of what we call the agroecological lighthouses, which are kind of successful farms that farmers can visit. The revival of traditional farming systems is another one. So there is a method, uh, a pedagogical method in Latin America called the Campesino Campesino, which is kind of a a horizontal way mechanism of trans transfer of knowledge and experiences between farmers. So uh, for example, in Cuba, they started in right after the, the, the special period with 216 uh, farmers that were using agroecological method. So today there's more than 130,000 and the whole way in which they has been scaled up is from farmer to farmer extension systems where for example, a promoter from a community that knows a particular practice comes and shares with other farmers in, in, in a neighboring community. And then each one of these farmers, women and men, become promoters and multiplying, having a multiplying effect. And uh, the case of the Mucuna, for example, in Central America was a spectacular uh, case of, um, 
of Palmer to Farmer Extension, where more than 45,000 families started growing mukune in less than a year, which is a legume that fixes nitrogen. And actually in the mountains uh, and also the biomass uh, is used as a, as a living mulch in order to promote the increase the production of maize and other crops. So many, many authors like Peter Rosset and his group in Ecosur in Mexico are be, have been studying what are the drivers of the scaling up of agroecology? And they have found that the existence of a crisis is an important one. The social organization is very important. You have to have agroecology socially activating. So you have to have a social milieu in which agroecology is, uh, is expanded. You have to have practices that are effective. Um, also, there are other uh, factors that have to do with uh, external allies, uh, important pedagogies, mobilizing these courses, markets, and policies. So agroecology doesn't end in just changing the farming system to become more resilient and biodiverse. It requires also a major shift from societies embedded in the market economy to a greater reliance on alternative food networks or food systems. Reducing the distance between producers and consumers is important in order to enhance the accessibility of healthy food. And um, <clears throat> Using the, uh, the ideas of Van der Plug, which is a, a very important uh, rural sociologist from the Netherlands, he says that basically what we need to create is an alternative bypass to the food system that is controlled by big corporations that determine what farm, farmers produce, what consumers produ uh, consume. And this bypass is basically local markets and also territories that are devoted and, and, uh, to agroecology and alliances between producers and consumers. So these territorial markets uh, that are usually um, provisioned by biodiverse farms and are oriented to local and regional um, populations are much more flexible to respond to changes and perturbations that are becoming more common. And these multiple commercialization short circuit channels for food sale and access make these territorial markets less vulnerable to price changes and collapse of centralized supply chains. And in addition, they, they reduce the dependence of producers and consumers from large corporations that control global food, food supply chains. So in conclusion, COVID-19 has exposed, in my opinion, the tragedy of animal factory farming and endless monocultures, which have led to dramatic losses of biodiversity, has created unhealthy conditions like obesity and malnutrition, food waste has also um, treated uh, farm workers, um, and this has become very obvious with the, with the COVID-19, um, to very bad uh, conditions, exposing them to, to COVID-19 and undermine the livelihoods of small farmers. Given this reality, agroecology's position itself as a key agricultural path that can provide rural families with significant socioeconomic and environmental benefits while feeding the urban masses equitably and sustainably. So I think it's important that we put food production in the hands of small producers, peasants, and urban farmers is the only way to ensure the supply of fresh food at affordable prices and in local markets away from the chains of the capitalist market. This retooling of the food system is based on short su supply chains, but will require providing small farmers with land, seeds, water, equitable markets, and so on. And we know the benefits of supporting small farmers, uh, enhances food sovereignty, promotes local economic growth, um, generate employment, reduce poverty, and promotes, promotes diverse diets and better nutrition by um, promoting local access to healthy, healthy food. And we as consumers, which we all are, uh, need to understand that eating is both an ecological and a political act. That when we support local farmers instead of huge corporate uh, food chains, uh, we are creating socio-ecological sustainability and resilience at, at the community level. And therefore, we have a, a political role. We need to acquire higher consciousness about the multiple ecological, social, cultural, and economic roles of peasant and small farm agriculture. And, there, and, and once we have that consciousness, then we, we have to have an active participation of consumers in creating and strengthening lo local food systems by pressuring local and regional governments to support agroecological initiatives. So a radical proposal that I have is that we, need, we, we require profound change in our food system that will not only uh, imply breaking the industrial monocultures with agroecology, 
but will also require to dismantle the control of multinationals of the, of the food system and the neoliberal policies that maintain such, such structure. And this transformation of change in agriculture must be accompanied by a shift from a market economy to a solidarity economy, from fossil fuel to renewable energy, and from big corporations controlling the food system to cooperatives, perhaps composed by consumers and producers. Such new world should be led by allied social, urban, and rural movements, aware that a return to the way agriculture was before the pandemics is not an option. Instead, we should be actively involved in turning local farms into a vital asset for providing food and promoting autonomy while consolidating healthy agroecological territories. So what we need is to move uh, an agricultural system to a system that is not highly vulnerable, but to a system that has low vulnerability and resilience to all kinds of external events, including pandemics. Uh, with agroecological principles, we, we can create a system that have a high response capacity um, given by tight social networks, collective action, applica application of agroecological principles. So we're moving from coping to transforming. Um, <clears throat> it, many people say climate change or system change. What is it that we need to address? So with that, uh, I will leave the group with a final question. Will the COVID-19 crisis provide the impetus to change industrial agriculture or a transition towards agroecological based food systems? Now that the global food supply chain chains suffer some disarray, is this the opportunity to strengthen local regional food hubs to prepare for looming emergencies such as climate change and more pandemics? Gracias. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Miguel, for a, a, a timely, uh, inspiring, and informative uh, talk. That was that was great. I think. Um, well, let some people. Uh, I don't. Uh, I think we. I, I would look for uh, questions in the chat and call on people. I don't know if I can manage all the the, the hand raising, um, <clears throat> but um, uh, no. I I think the w one aspect I guess for me to to lead it off is in in the thinking about the the systems. Um, Think about the, the the production practices. I think I, I can visualize talking about one of the things behind the scenes, though, and is my from my perspective is, can you tell me about how the the seeds uh, work, how they are shared in such a system, how they come about? And we in developed work or in like the organic seed movement, we have a question about what should we design, uh, what what background can we use in this design? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, seeds are the basis of the whole thing. And uh, <clears throat> farmers share the seeds. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of national policies that, um, that, are, that are somehow influenced by the UPOV uh, that are not allowing farmers to keep their seeds or exchange their seeds. And, uh, but there's a lot of resistance at the local level in many communities where the, the farmers continue with an old practice of sharing seeds of um, networks of seeds, um, because um, actually seed diversity is also very connected to lock, uh, to cultural diversity and vice versa. If you if you get rid of cultural diversity, you get rid of seed diversity immediately, at least in the context of Latin America and rural areas. And uh, it's part of the culture, it's part of the traditions. Uh, women, for example, give seeds to their daughters when they get married. Uh, so it's, there, there's, there's a long, there's a many, many uh, cultural and, and uh, aspects connected to, to seeds. And there, there's also a lot of efforts. Uh, there's a lot of uh, seed fairs that occur in, uh, in many areas of um, Peru, in, in Mexico, or here in Colombia, where farmers exchange seeds. Uh, if, even if you go to, um, to farmer's market to buy food, you'll find farmers selling seeds or seedlings or fruit trees and things of that nature. So, they are very informal networks. Now, um, obviously, some of these material can be improved, and I think that participatory methods of uh, plant breeding are key, and uh, the involvement of researchers to make sure that this material that is being reproduced is uh, highly adaptable, is free of diseases. All that, all that, I think, is is, is important. So that the role of plant breeders continues to be, to be fundamental, and many of the tools, the new tools that that, that you guys use. I imagine also can play an important role. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Miguel, you had spoken toward the end about actions that need to be taken to move agricultural systems toward an agroecology approach. And one of those was to pressure state and national governments. In the countries in which you've worked or are working, how cooperative or non-cooperative are the governments? Yeah, that's a very important question. Thank you, Don. Uh, actually, in Latin America, there are two countries right now that have a national law of agroecology, uh, Brazil and Uruguay. And this did not happen because uh, some illuminated politician said, let's promote agroecology. Social movements for years and years and years were pressuring the, 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 the local politicians, the national politicians, to a point that uh, their pressure was so high that they had to create these laws. And so right now, elements of the law are not being applied in, in Brazil as they should because of the government they have, but um, they're there. There are legal instruments that, uh, that, that have many, many, many aspects. These laws are very, very interesting. And I think it would be interesting for, and I know that there are people in the United States that have studied the the national law of agroecology of, of Brazil. One of the things that it has is the, um, is for example, the provisioning of food uh, to the schools that has to come from local farmers. 30% of the food that is served in the school has to come from local farmers. Can you imagine that tomorrow, you know, Cornell, uh, I'm sorry, Ithaca says, all the food that we're gonna eat in the schools and the university, Cornell University and the hospitals has to come from the small farmers. That would be an incredible instrument to, um, by, to revit, revit, revitalize farmers because they don't have to be competing in markets. They're they are entering to what we call the social markets, the institutional markets. And, and therefore, and then actually the governments save food because save money, because usually um, they buy the food from big institutions, you know, and uh, that, that brings kids unhealthy food like pizzas and hamburgers and things like that. Can you imagine food coming, organic food coming from local farmers that would have an incredible impact also on public health. So all these things uh, I think are important that we um, that they would take into account. And there are other governments like the Colombian government and the Chilean government that are not at all interested that I'm familiar with, with this type of initiatives. But eventually um, it depends on, on the climate, you know, on the political climate, I think the United States right now, it's, I, I would argue that it's ready for changes of this nature. And, uh, and I know that there are a lot of people working in the social justice, food justice movement that are thinking about um, pressuring politicians to, to make the changes or to provide the policies framework for these changes to happen. Any other any questions for Miguel? So, uh, Paul, uh, I could read your question if you would like to read it, uh, or if you'd like to, to ask it, please unmute. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miguel, for your presentation. That's something that I was looking for. I have one question. Since, um, um, you know, the main agriculture, the monocrops agriculture, and the advancing agriculture just promote, um, like, advanced um, and technology, like for this kind of uh, agriculture, monoculture, how can we, uh, the agriculture, could use the advance of the agriculture, so that precision agriculture, to promote um, agroecology systems? Well, I think, um, you know, um, I'm aware of the advances of pre precision agriculture, digital farming. Um, that the, the main rationale for that is to is to be able to kind of uh, model crop fields and provide crops the precise amount of the inputs they need, the amount of water, the amount of nitrogen, the amount of pesticides, the amount of fungicides, and so on. Um, that's something that in, in, in agroecology um, we would not be interested in the sense that um, the the rationale of uh, promoting biological control of pests or soil soil um, organic matter regeneration for nutrient cycling and so on is different. However, um, if farmers are interested and can afford, you know, the, the technologies that you're talking about, 
uh, I'm not going to hold them, you know, um, um, uh, prisoners of, of, of not doing that. I think farmers have the freedom if, if they feel that some elements of precision agriculture can serve the purpose of uh, creating more agroecologically based systems, fine. The problem is that the peasants that I know here in Latin America or where I'm working right now, they cannot afford even a cell phone. And so how can they have access to, to that kind of technology? But agroecology is not limited to small farmers. Agroecology can be used by large scale farmers. I didn't show examples of farmers in Argentina and Brazil that are, and in Chile, including, that are using agroecological systems, um, but they have 2,000, 3,000 hectares. Now, the design of those farms um, depend, are, are totally different from the system that I showed, and they require machinery, and they, they, they could benefit definitely from precision agriculture techniques. So agroecology is not something that it will put you in a, in, a, in a jail where you cannot do this. It's like organic farming, that you, that you cannot use this, you cannot use that. Um, the, the issue is that we don't need to use pesticides when you when you design the farms uh, based on the agroecological principles because they they reach a, a, a level of balance. I'm witnessing this by practice. I'm not talking theory. I'm I'm farming here. I started two years ago, and I I haven't used one drop of anything, um, but I see that the system is sm slowly advancing and, cre and and creating a balance. We have the presence of some insects and some diseases and some soil fertility problems we do, but they, they become obviated with time. So to answer the question, yeah, farmers that, that feel that they can use some precision agriculture techniques or, or models, uh, go ahead. And some of us uh, students and postdocs have the chance to talk to Miguel a little bit more at 1.30, uh, but I, I have bunches of questions. I don't know if anyone else has one before I Pepper him with mine. <laughs> Some of the students would be nice. Some of the young people, yeah. what are they thinking? <laughs> yeah. I need I need some new ideas. Some, uh, some Luis. Challenges. <laughs> I see Luis's hand up. Yes. Hi. Um, so I was just wondering. Um, so there there is a I see that like a disconnection between the fact that there is like a growing population. But at the same time, one of the main arguments that we hear is uh, agroecology takes a lot of manpower because uh, like most of the time you, you will reduce the use of machinery because machinery uh, it's almost meant for monocropping. Uh, so I was wondering if this could be like the, the, the opportunity to kind of reconnect the urban and rural uh, uh, population because with the pandemic a lot and lots of people have started started to do a uh, work from home like here and if I just continue doing like working from home maybe I just save uh, one or even two hours of my day every day and work like I could be living on a farm and spending these two hours working in the field or doing whatever chores that the farmer can, tells me what to do and then maybe that could be an opportunity to kind of bridge the, the gap that exists between there is too much people, but we don't have nobody on the farms to, 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 do, to do the work. I was wondering what you think about this equation that maybe there's an opportunity here. Well, uh, Luis, uh, thanks for the question. You see, one of the one of the things um, that we need to debate more about is the fact that hunger doesn't have anything to do with food production. I mean, there's hungry people in the United States. It's not because there's no food, and uh, there's some there's poverty, there's lack of access to land, there's other structural issues that explain hunger. And this discourse, this narrative that we need to increase production because if we don't double food production by the year 2050, people are gonna go starving, has no basis. It's, it's all ideological. This, this Malthusian view is the one that permeated the Green Revolution. And um, you know, today, right now, we have 1 billion people that are hungry in the world. Is it because there's no food? I mean, how much food do we throw away in the United States per person? 115 kilos per person. Um, how much land in the south is being devoted to grow biofuels instead of food. 
uh, there are many issues that, that we need to address before we can start even discussing the question about um, food production and, and population growth. Um, I think that this is something that has many, many dimensions and I respect all the opinions on this, but it, I, I think it has to be debated more than it has been. Uh, we just cannot accept the narrative, you know, just like is presented uh, by FAO or whoever is promoting these views that we need to double fruit production by the year 2050. I, and, I agree. and then obviously there's no farmers, but what is the pro how many people are unemployed right now in the United States? Why don't we put them to f f grow food? That's, you know, a small farm generate one, three times more jobs than conventional large scale monocultures. So why don't we put people to grow food? I mean, it's, it's a respectable job. The, the fact is that nobody wants to do that. Uh, uh, only the immigrants and you know we're used to an agriculture that in the United States that was based first on slavery and then on cheap labor coming from from other countries you know it, isn't it time that we uh, or the people of the United States uh, start farming why not what is what's it, what's the problem with that the problem is that access to land if you want to go farming in California as a young person you you cannot do it because you cannot afford the land and actually the report Go to a report of a website called the Young Farmers of America, and the main problem that they, they mention for them to, the main barrier for them to farm is access to land. So we have to have policies to provide the land to people that want to farm. But, but that, on that matter, I was wondering, like, is there, uh, is there a possibility that the, like the model that we see here in North America, one farmer, one farm, and then everybody else is employee or machinery, Maybe this is uh, like uh, like the nuclear family. This would be like the nuclear farm. Maybe the, the a better system would be like several families for one farm, and then it becomes like you can share the cost of acquisition. And, uh... Well, this this is a model that existed in the United States. Small farms declined rapidly in in about fifty years, and 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 the land became more and more concentrated. In the hands of a few it's because in the us and in many other countries the only way to farm is to get big or get out okay so these things need to change and these are policy these are changes of, of the economic system and this is something that we need to debate as humanity if we want to survive are, do we want to continue the same way we we have been or do we want to change our, our our economic system in order to face the challenges that that as humanity we we are facing and, and I feel that we need to make a radical change, not only in agriculture, in many, many aspects of our industry and our society. Thank you very much. I really appreciated your, your presentation. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, Thomas, see your hand is up. Thank you. I'm unmuted. So thanks for speaking to us there, Cornell. It's so fun to have you here. So, so you're talking about um, having a, a policy or a program for purchasing local food. And so New York has actually had that for some time for the school districts. They have programs where the state helps support local school districts buying local food. And so I've been working with one of my projects in trying to get more local food that we can produce well into the school districts uh, in that program. And mm -hmm. one of the uh, things that's really prevented it from happening is that the local food, to make it be enough profit for the grower, has to be so expensive that it's not competitive with the commodity vegetables, even with the subsidy, even with the, the technical support that's available from the state. So I wonder whether you've seen any solutions to that particular uh, obstacle. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, if you're going to compete with the economics of scale, uh, there's no way. Uh, this has to be highly subsidized. And that's mm -hmm. the way that has that, yeah. been done in and, Brazil. And we have that subsidy in place. But yeah, it's... But, but it's not just subsidy. You have to also train farmers to, um, if they use agroecology, their cost of production can be reduced up to 50%. So these farmers that you're 
procuring uh, mm -hmm. that you're procuring a food from are not necessarily ba based on agroecology. They are probably conventional farmers, some are organic organic farmers. There some of the cost of production are huge. Yeah. Actually, so, I I would say we're doing pretty good on the bringing agroecological principles to vegetable production in New York. We're not we're not bad. Okay, great. So. One way, one way would be through training and extension and research to reduce mm -hmm. the cost of production mm -hmm. dramatically, which yeah. can be achieved. And the second one would be uh, policies that would uh, that that would basically um, protect small farmers, because what happens is that you can you can be doing what you're doing, but at the same time, the local governor or the regional government is bringing food from. Uh, from another region, uh, mm -hmm. food that the farmers produce. So one of the thing, the things that, for example, in in Brazil they do is that they don't allow any imports of food that the local farmers are producing. Mm. So it it, it has right. many angles, and I, in California, I know that there's many efforts in the same direction that you're talking about, and some of them have have not been economically viable, but within the existing economic system. Right. If we change the economic system, if we change some some of the uh, some of the pillars, then maybe things could be different. So yeah. um, definitely bringing it's not easy. Theoretically, sounds <laughs> interesting. I'm sure you appreciate that. And but yeah. bringing it to practice, you find all these barriers that you're talking about. But yeah. those, barriers, those barriers are not because the idea is bad. It's because the existing system does not allow is 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 uh, is basically biased against what you want to do so that's the importance of the political change the economic change you yeah. cannot promote an alternative that that with with the same uh, uh system that that, that promoted the, yeah. the the other system that you want to change you know yeah. well, <laughs> me, that, you, you you raise an interesting thing let me ask a more more difficult question uh, uh -huh. here uh the change in the political system mm -hmm. is fiercely opposed by the farmers here fiercely opposed they are absolutely opposite political camps uh, so how you know this this may be an unanswerable question <laughs> how does how do you get a common interest to get that political change if you have the two groups at the opposite ends are you talking about the large farmers or the small farmers? If you talk to farmers around here, the They're small old. farmers are not that politically different from the large farmers. Mm -hmm. Well, are they politically organized? Yes. Okay. Well, I don't know how to change the mentality of farmers uh, other, than by, <laughs> yeah. other than by example. Yeah. I know that one of the methods that we use the lighthouses is mm -hmm. that there is a farmer that is successful, mm -hmm. successfully producing yeah. without inputs, uh, with very low cost of production. Yeah. That's a very major instrument. The first is that's the first instrument for the change. Yeah. Then, comes, then comes the other conversation that what this farmer is doing, in addition to changing mm -hmm. his uh, farming system to a more biodiverse system, et cetera, et cetera. Right. It's also a, a, a system that is the resistance to the to, to the, the the dominant economic system, right? The alternative, and that's where the conversation comes in too. So um, that's the way it works in Latin America. I mean, yeah. the farmer to farmer right. network. What happens is that the the reality of of oppression of small farmers in Latin America is very different from the U.S. Yeah. Here, farmers are highly organized politically, especially mm -hmm. those that belong to the Dia Campesina. And actually, in the U.S., yeah. there are chapters of Dia Campesina that have a political discourse that somehow is permeating very interesting, interesting. things, like, for example, black farmers. Yeah. Many black farmers are becoming politically organized yeah. and with a with a with a, pol a different right. political narrative than mm -hmm. the that that you're talking about. Good. Thank you for tackling that one. That's not an easy one. <laughs> so, Michael, unfortunately, our time is up and we want to give Professor Altieri a moment for a sip of water before he meets with the group of students. So uh, let's thank Professor Altieri for really a fascinating and substantive talk today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'll take a little break and I'll be back in a few minutes. <laughs> Very good. Yep.
Thanks, Miguel. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.